Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, the skin crawling scenario of bed bugs on a submarine. Plus a conversation with a Navy SEAL turned astronaut who tells us which job was harder to train for. And we talk to a senior army official about China and the future of ground vehicles. And hear about a deal for Saudi companies to produce a Turkish drone. Plus updates on the Army combat fitness test and a change to Marine Recon Sniper School. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. A lot of news to get to this week, so let's kick it off in the Navy. It's hard to think of a situation more skin crawling than an infestation of bed bugs on a Navy submarine. Hot racking, close quarters, and limited cleaning options make it a tough problem. Add some accusations from sailors of issues getting leaders to address it, and it all gets worse. Military Times' Jesse Karangu has more. Living in a submarine is already tough for many sailors on board. But now imagine living in a submarine that was infested by bed bugs. That was the case for the fast attack sub Connecticut, and it became a flashing point between enlisted sailors and their leaders. We spoke to the Navy Times Jeff Zuzulowitz, who told us how this happened, as well as how he discovered this story. So, uh, you know, several of our stories here at Navy Times come to us from uh, sailors in the fleet who, uh, you know, feel their command is doing them wrong or that uh, a certain situation needs to be aired out. And the story of the bed bugs aboard uh, the submarine Connecticut was one of those situations. We were contacted by a petty officer who, like most sailors, requested anonymity uh, to speak freely with us uh, to avoid retribution from his command. But this petty officer basically told us that for most of 2020, the Connecticut's been dealing with a uh, rampant bed bug infection that has just impacted, you know, every corner of life in the cramped confines of the submarine. So it's one of those stories that we wouldn't have been able to bring to the public and hopefully push some change if a sailor hadn't reached out to us in the first place. And how bad did the sailors say the infestation got? Uh, pretty bad, pretty bad. Um, anybody who's had experiences with bed bugs knows they are a uh, stubborn, nasty little insect that can be very, very hard to get rid of. Um, you know, a big problem for the sailors, according to several I spoke with, was uh, they alleged that the command didn't believe them. Uh, they had a hard time catching uh, any bed bugs to show to the command for some time. And uh, the Navy actually has a policy that they don't begin uh, fatal countermeasures, as, as one official put it, uh, until you actually find the bed bugs. So, uh, you know, the submariners aboard the sub were getting bitten up for most of 2020, but it sounds like the command didn't even really begin to listen to them until they actually were able to capture some of these things and uh, uh, bring them to the, to the triad. Uh, according to sailors we spoke with, sailors, you know, submariners took to you know, sleeping in the crew mess area where they eat their meals or sleeping in chairs, uh, just sleeping anywhere to get away from the racks that have become infested. And uh, uh, something that makes this a little bit more hellacious is that uh, on a fast attack submarine like the Connecticut, uh, sailors do what's called hot racking. Um, most of you in the fleet probably know what that is, but it basically involves sharing your bed and you you get it for a shift. So. Uh, I think that kind of made, you know, last year doubly nasty for the uh, the bug bitten crew of the Connecticut. And what's the Navy saying that they did in order to uh, cheat these bugs? Uh, they have done a bunch of different uh, measures. Um, Navy approved pesticide sprays. 
Um, and, you know, they say they brought in some new mattresses and things like that. Uh, and that, you know, Navy entomologists uh, have cleared the boat and cleared these spaces for habitation. Um, but, you know, they didn't, when I asked, they didn't definitively say, you know, this ship is uh, bed bug free. Again, that speaks to just how pernicious these these pests can be. There's certain problems that can happen when there's a bed bug infestation in a submarine. Uh, what are those? What are those kind of problems that could happen? Sure. Um, you know, part of it just goes to the nature of uh, submarine lives and, and missions. I mean, you're in this metal tube far, far below the sea, uh, below the surface level, rather. Uh, you're doing very secretive me- missions in close quarters. And several sailors we spoke to from the Connecticut said, look, when you're getting bitten up by bed bugs, you don't get a good night's sleep. And then you go to your work shift fatigued. And one petty officer told me, you know, he worries that, you know, some exhausted bed bug bitten sailor is going to be, you know, driving the boat and quote, crash into an underwater mountain because they're tired. So, you know, sub life is already stressful enough and already kind of exists on this, you know, razor's edge of, of capability and, and all that. And so when you throw in exhaustion because you're getting bitten up by an insect infestation, it just makes the consequences that much more potentially severe. Now, sailors are telling Jeff that morale in the sub is reportedly in the toilet. They stress to our colleague that living on a sub requires a certain tempo, but this has just made matters worse. Between the sailors saying one thing and the Navy saying that they've done enough to control the problem, we're really not sure whether enough was done or not. I'm Jesse Karangu for Defense News Weekly. Thanks, Jesse. In other service news, the Army is set to test launch its next version of the combat fitness test on April 1st. The new iteration offers a plank as a replacement option for a leg tuck and does away with job-specific standards for soldiers. It also revamps the scoring system above an Army baseline, so men's scores are measured against men and women against women to equalize performance evaluation during promotion boards. Though soldiers will start taking the test in April, the Army is still in an information gathering phase and scores won't count against troops until 2022. And over in the Marine Corps, reconnaissance Marines now have a quicker path to become snipers. A new shortened course cuts a quarter of the 12 week training school by eliminating overlaps with training Marines already receive to earn the recon MOS. The modified course will also include skills tailored specifically for the reconnaissance mission, while increasing the number of scout sniper course slots available for regular Marine infantry. Recon Marines will not earn the 0317 Marine Scout Sniper secondary MOS by taking the course. And that's it for your military headlines this week. When we come back, a look at the plan for the Army's next generation combat vehicle. And later, a conversation with a Navy SEAL turned astronaut. China is a major strategic focus of the United States, and U.S. Army Futures Command is exploring land vehicles to traverse the massive country. The unit's working on programs such as the Armored Multipurpose Combat Vehicle, Mobile Protected Firepower, and the Optionally Manned Fighting Vehicle, which would replace the Bradley. Those vehicles may even be able to launch their own smaller unmanned aerial and ground vehicles. As part of the Association of the United States Army Global Force Next event, Ground Warfare reporter Jen Judson spoke to the Army officer leading the charge. All right, uh, General Kaufman, thanks so much for taking the time uh, to join us uh, on Defense News to talk a little bit about what you're doing with Next Generation Combat Vehicle now. Um, You've recently come out and talked a lot about the pacing threat of China uh, and how that's influencing what you are doing in your portfolio. what is under development in your portfolio that's suited for conflict against Chinese in that region or elsewhere? Um, and is there any direction you're headed in development that needs tweaking in order to ensure the Army is able to bring overmatch in conflict there? Yeah, so it's a great question. Thanks, Jen. And look, the Pacific uh, is just fascinating. Uh, and, you know, everyone thinks that it's the ocean. But no, the Pacific region, the Indo-Pacom region, has a ton of land. 
and should we go to conflict there, uh, we're going to be fighting on the land. And if you're going to fight on the land, what do you need? You need tanks. You need armored vehicles because they can be decisive. They can clear. They can hold. And they can take terrain. Uh, so I think all of the programs that we're working on are directly applicable against our pacing threat, which is China. What we have to do is make sure that uh, what we're developing is worldwide deployable. And with, a, with the knowledge we have about the Chinese armored forces and fighting forces that we are modernizing to overmatch against them. And we have to weigh that against uh, deployability, survivability, lethality. And so you can envision a robot, a amp V, an MPF, uh, or our number one priority, OMFV, uh, in Asia, somewhere in the 27 million square kilometers, I said million square kilometers of land where half the population of the world lives. I can absolutely see it all. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit about um, some of other efforts that you have in your portfolio. Uh, we got a good rundown of the light and medium robotic combat vehicles um, and where those are in development and evaluation. And you just wrapped up in 2020 a big evaluation of the heavy RCVs at Fort Carson uh, using M113 surrogates. So we, we didn't hear a lot yesterday about the RCV heavy. Um, why is RCV heavy development going to be further behind the other two RCV development efforts? And is this capability potentially too similar to things like the optionally manned fighting vehicle or an optionally manned tank even? So it comes down to cost and being good stewards of uh, the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, the lights and mediums are, are far less expensive. We can learn all the lessons that we need to learn about uh, user interface, uh, radio tethers that allow you to go certain distances, the autonomy package, the uh, the kernel, the software kernel that goes into these vehicles that is government developed. Uh, so once we have we have done that, we're using lights and mediums to really work through that and how we'll fight it. And then it's a material solution for the heavies on the backside. But to buy it, to spend all that money on a heavy surrogate and then have to go back um, and, and then redo that and recompete it, uh, it just didn't make fiscal sense. You know, after seeing them uh, under evaluation or seeing how you might use them in the future um, through the evaluation that you had at Port Carson and obviously some other evaluations that you've had, um, does the Army still see, uh, you know, this as a very important capability to have in the future or is it potentially proving to be something that may be too cumbersome or just not necessary? Uh, the the feedback is has really been positive. Um, Look, we went out to Fort Carson, Colorado, as you know. We had the, the mighty 4th Infantry Division soldiers out controlling them. Uh, they were 113s that we turned into robots. And to get them in the hands of soldiers, do some quick learning. Look, I've been around 113s my whole career. Okay, uh, they are a bit underwhelming. The four lights and the four mediums that we did build, okay, purpose-built robots, are really awesome. The light goes something like 43 miles an hour. Okay, this is like a robot going 43 miles an hour across broken terrain is awesome. And then when you start talking about the different payloads of weapons and sensors and uh, smoke generation, etc., really exciting stuff. And then, I mean, if you look at the medium, I mean, this thing has a UAV on the top and a UGV that comes out of it. So it's a, it's got, it's a robot that hatches robots. You got the ground and the air coming off of this thing. And they, these are absolutely going to change the way that we gain contact with the enemy. So in the Army, we want to gain contact with the smallest element possible. And that allows us to maintain decision space. Well, if you have a robot uh, out there making contact with the enemy first, and if it's a medium and it's got a 30 millimeter chain gun on it so that it can shoot, move, and communicate and deal destruction on anything that gets in its way, that's a pretty doggone good option for a combat leader, if you ask me. Thank you again for taking the time, and I hope you have a great rest of your day, and enjoy you the rest too. of the conference. Take care. Thanks, Jen. And now for some business news. 
Two Saudi Arabian manufacturers have started co-producing a Turkish-made medium-altitude long-endurance drone. Intra Defense Technologies, an advanced electronics company, will produce the Carryall SU under license from Vestal Savumna. Vestal Savumna did not respond to a request for comment, but a company official told Defense News on the condition of anonymity that AEC will provide electronics parts and Vestal will supply essential critical components of the aircraft. Turkish defense analyst Anil Sahin told Defense News that the co production program involves building a batch of 40 Carryall SU aircraft between 2021 and 2025. The Turkish drone will be reflagged as Habub in Saudi Arabia. When unloaded, the Carryall SU can fly up to 20 hours at an altitude of 18,000 feet or for eight hours with a 120 kilogram payload. It can fly at a speed of 60 to 80 knots at a range of up to 150 kilometers. The U.S. Navy sealed the deal this month on a 10th ship in its latest iteration of the Virginia-class attack submarine issuing a $2.4 billion adjustment on a contract initially awarded in December 2019. The original contract was for nine boats with an option for a tenth, which brings the total cost of the contract with prime contractor General Dynamics Electric Boat to $24.1 billion. Huntington Angles Industries Newport News Shipyard is the partner yard in the program. The modern Virginia-class subs coming off the line can hold 12 Tomahawk missiles and a launcher on the bow and are expected to host hypersonic missiles when that technology is available. And that's it for industry news this week. When we come back, personal finance expert Jeanette Mack teaches service members the basic rules of budgeting. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack breaks down the fundamental rules of good budgeting techniques. Budgeting is a lot like breakfast. We know it's important, but we don't always have the time or the energy for it. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, and budgeting is vital to managing your money. The first rule of budgeting is know where your money is going. And the second is save the rest. It's that easy. Just examine your monthly expenses one time. Account for your bills first, then ask yourself, are the other expenditures necessary like dining out, coffee runs, and unused subscriptions or memberships? You'd be surprised what you're spending money on that you don't need, don't use, or have forgotten about. Then you'll have an idea of how much discretionary income or extra money you actually have. This is where you can find the money for savings that you can transfer automatically from your primary account to a savings account every month or at your own pace. Even if it's only five bucks, it adds up. To make it fun, challenge friends or family to see who can boost their savings the most. There's no one right way to budget, but doing it will bring you more than what money can buy. And that's peace of mind. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more of our coverage, be sure to hit up our websites at Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com and DefenseNews.com. To get a list of our top stories each weekday in your inbox, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, we have a conversation with a Navy SEAL who decided that career wasn't difficult enough. So he signed up to go to space. Welcome back. Before he was an astronaut, Navy Captain Chris Cassidy had already spent 11 years as a Navy SEAL, where he deployed to Afghanistan just two weeks after September 11th. Deciding that kind of thing wasn't hard enough, Cassidy applied to be an astronaut and was selected in 2004. Defense News Weekly caught up with Cassidy late last year, just after he returned home from 196 days on the International Space Station, and talked to him about the transition from SEAL to astronaut. It wasn't until I was in the SEAL teams that it dawned on me that, that anybody can apply, civilian, military, whatever. And that's when I, so I was probably 25 or 26 when, when I, I realized what the process was and how do you do it. I like doing active operational things and, and seeing spacewalks and people sitting in capsules of a, of a spaceship. It all seemed very intriguing to me and uh, hands-on kind of active actively doing stuff and that appealed to me as a job and then the cool factor of going to space is, was a, a draw as well you know i thought it'd be pretty neat this is mission control houston 
Endeavor's roll maneuver is being completed. And then I learned more about the job and there's way more to it than just going to space. I mean, I've been here for 17 years and only one year of that has been in space. So we do a lot of other stuff supporting uh, space in general. And I like that part too. Cassidy also had insight on which process was tougher, joining the SEALs or becoming an astronaut, and how his military career has helped him at NASA. The instructors don't want you to become a Navy SEAL until you graduate. Once I got selected to be an astronaut, the instructors wanted me to be an astronaut. They weren't trying to kick, kick me out. So it's a different mindset. And it's obviously way more physical, the entry level training to become a SEAL than it is to be an astronaut. And I would say it's more academic once you become once you get selected an astronaut to learn how to become an astronaut it's it's more like graduate school so it's really apples to oranges and uh, i think that um when i was a young person right out of college i was eager and ready for that hard physical challenge of seal training now is is some a little bit later in life uh very happy that i'm not doing push-ups all day long with uh sand in my face my training and background as a, as a military person absolutely helped me talking on the radio, thinking about problems two or three steps in advance. What am I gonna do if this happens? Assessing what you, your mission is, what the objective is, and then what are the risks of each step of it and determining your decisions based on that. That was all something I, that was ingrained in me from my military background and we do that exact same thing here. And if there's someone who knows a few things about harrowing moments, Cassidy is certainly one. He talked about one of the scariest experiences he's had in space. In, uh, in my NASA work, hands down the most intense time was on a spacewalk seven years ago with my partner Luca had water leaking into his helmet, which in space we don't want water in our helmets. I see deep sweat. No, that's not sweat. No, it's not sweat. Hey, Luca, can you clarify, is it increasing or not increasing? It's hard to tell, but it feels like a lot of water. Uh, that was a big deal. And we got everything back in safely, and he was fine. And it was a lot of learning for the NASA engineers and for the astronauts to figure out why the water was there and how it happened. But in the moment, as it was happening and we were outside the space station going around Earth five miles a second and still had 40 minutes to get back inside, that was a pretty intense time frame. I feel a lot of water on the back of my head, but I don't think it speaks from my back. Are you sweating? Are you working hard? Um, I'm sweating, but it feels like a lot of water. Where the wind is coming from there? It's too much. I don't know. It's a lot. That's my eyes. So, Luca, we'll have you head back to the airlock. Chris, we'll get a plan for you to uh, clean things up here and then join him here in a minute. And then in the military uh, deployments, much like other folks can with experiences in combat, different combat missions can be pretty intense. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.